my jacket was on the Good afternoon. Hey, my name is John McWaves. On behalf of the Melbourne Historical Society, welcome to part two in our annual lecture series. And uh, happy President's Day. This lecture series is uh, a major part of our, our, our mission here to preserve and promote history. And also part of that, I remind you that you pass the table uh, in the lobby and weigh in. There's a lot of materials out there about the Historical Society and also welcome you to consider uh, perhaps taking a more active role in doing this. Uh, this is President's Day, and uh, in the past years, uh, particularly for those of the regulars, we tried to match up a speaker with the occasion, and uh, this may not be a better fit than we, we've ever had. I have uh, a personal connection with our speaker today, because after he earned his uh, PhD at Penn State University, spent 36 years teaching American history at State College High School, uh, just down the hall from where I work. My wife spent most of her years, they overlapped in that way. So, and I'd also say that uh, Dr. Farrell, Dr. Greg Farrell, has a very impressive resume at that level in his uh, professional career. Uh, he uh, recognizes one of the four, uh, well, they do State College Magazine annually recognizes four best teachers in the area, which includes uh, at least four districts, so we're talking hundreds of, of teachers, and uh, also a nominee for the Disney World Teacher of the Year and listed as best teachers. And so it's, uh, but as impressive as that resume is, uh, I might be even more impressed with his, uh, what I would call, a post-career career. And that since then, he's been very active and out and about. Uh, continuing to share his passion about with, uh, American history with audiences uh, pretty much around the country. He's been several years at Chautauqua in New York State. And so it occurred to me last summer that he might be a good choice for this day. And so I was excited in, I think it was maybe June, said, uh, would you be interested in uh, participating in our lecture series? And he said yes, and I thought, oh, great, okay. So. Uh, let's talk about what we can do here and uh, how, how we can uh, work together on this. So we spent uh, an hour or so on our deck one afternoon, and he brought he has a very again extensive list of topics that he's been talking about over the years. You know, where, where to begin? Here. And I know he's done a lot of work with uh, American presidents, and I, all right, he's good for this day. So we narrowed that down. So what are we going to do? Let's, well, how about? Uh, the most interesting presidents. Okay, I mean, you have the greatest presidents, the most successful, most effective. Historians are constantly ranking and re-ranking presidents, but there's reasonably pretty specific criteria you can use for that. But most interesting, I thought that's kind of vague. I don't know where to begin. I, I was a little concerned, and we talked through it, and I thought that would be interesting. <laughs> so, so uh, here we are, and um, oftentimes I get to, uh, questions uh, from people, uh, a couple of reporters of last week's about what we look for in our speakers here, and some of you regulars would you know, may recall, uh, there's certain uh, measurements, criteria I have in my mind as to inform, enlighten, and entertain, and our speaker today, I should have checked all those boxes. But also in the back of my mind, I like a speaker who is provocative. And if we can throw that into the mix, a speaker who will maybe challenge the audience a bit, think uh, through that, stir your intellectual curiosity, give them something to think about on your way out or talk about. So, and I found so no doubt that that will happen today, this afternoon as well. So. Please give a very warm welcome to Dr. Greg Farrell, who is here for this I can't teach unless I have my rum and coke. We're good. Let me go over some uh, logistics first. First of all, uh, we can all do two things at the same time. Do a glance over that uh, quote up there on the front, in the front, that's very important. But I want you to know that when you leave, you can designate, if you're here with somebody else, have maybe one of you, there's a table there, there's a table there, and what's going to be on that table? What's going to be on that table is a report card you can use for presidents, 
Also on those two tables are going to be a definition for the criteria. And also, you can pick up a third handout. And that third handout is uh, four or five, six years ago, I'm not sure when, uh, they rank the presidents best to worst. So when you leave, not now, or else you'll be looking through the papers all the time I'm trying to talk, okay? Uh, that table there, that table there, pick up three things. Report card, definitions for the items on the report card, and then a list of the people who have made a, a big study of these various presidents, a, a good many of them. Uh, please notice here, presidential rankings change over time. This fluctuation especially affects recent presidents. It takes time to evaluate a presidency and to see the long-term impact of a president's accomplishments or failures. Actions that may have been considered a big mistake at the time can turn out to be a stroke of genius decades later. At the same time, a courageous move may turn into a disastrous mistake when viewed with the benefit of hindsight. So you can expect the more recent presidents to move up and down the rankings ladder in years to come. Uh, I want to make sure that we're clear on that. This is not a math class. Uh, heaven forbid I was teaching math for 36 years. Two and two always adds up to four. I'm glad I was teaching uh, history uh, because there's always new interpretations. There's new, there's new things coming out. Let me give, give you a quick idea. Uh, I wasn't going to start this way, but now I can't help myself. You have a new movie out called The Zone of Interest. The Zone of Interest. And it looks at the Holocaust. It's basically a documentary. It looks at the Holocaust from the superintendent of Auschwitz concentration camp. Right, out right now, zone of interest. What I'm pointing out is news, history is always making the news, et cetera, et cetera, which makes it a difficult subject to stay up on. There's a new book also out on the Holocaust. There's a new book out on the love letters between presidents and their wives and presidents and their mistresses. It is brand new. It is brand new. And I don't know about you, but Woodrow Wilson, he said I could call him Woody. Uh, Woodrow Wilson, uh, president from 1912 to 1920, uh, they took a, a, a phrase that he used in one of his letters to his wife and used that as the title for the book. In one of his letters to his wife, he said, Are you prepared for the storm of love making? <laughs> uh, right? you know? Woody, Woody was a prof over there in Princeton. I, I didn't see that aspect of it. That's a brand new book, okay? You don't have to watch the soap operas, read this book, okay? So we got a movie out right now. We got a book out, both of those who are in the Holocaust. We got a book which is about the love lives of presidents and so on and so forth. And I'm thumbing through the New York Times today, and in today's New York Times, today's New York Times, there's an article on uh, former President Jimmy Carter. A year ago today, a year ago today, he was put on hospice. Of all the people put on hospice in America, only 6% last a year. It's another example of Jimmy Carter beating the odds. Okay, that's today's New York Times. Movies, books, etc., etc. So you get a chance, you may want to pursue uh, one of those there. Uh, just to make a cautionary note here before we go too far, our enemy today is time. This is a combination of two courses. I teach a course on rankings throughout the mid-Atlantic states, and I usually have at least three, sometimes four hours. Then I teach a course on the six most interesting presidents. That takes three or four hours. I'm going to supposedly do this <laughs> in less than two hours. Are you kidding me? But I did invite, there's a gentleman in the back of the room. Uh, he is here uh, from the Guinness Book of Records. Uh, was, <laughs> I like that, huh? Uh, th this man is moving towards an A+. Plus. If you laugh at my jokes, if you laugh at my jokes, you're right to the A+. Plus, you know? So anyway, so the guy, the Guinness Book of Records guy, he's, he's here to, make, to see if this happens. I want to thank John McWilliams, Mr. Jones, and Beaver Industrial Park for helping this event happen. Uh, so, let me move on here, since again, time is our enemy. Uh, let's see, we're, we kind of start with a little humor. I know he's going to, your first name, sir? Alan. Alan. I know Alan's going to laugh at this, but the rest of you should think this is pretty funny, too. You always got to start off with a joke. We are only dealing with presidents of the 20th century. And I'm, I'm amazed that I was minding my own business. I'm making sure everybody's got a handout. I'm walking past here, and a certain person, I'm not going to identify the person and say they have a gray sweater. I'm not going to do that. I don't like to embarrass people. But she says, well, how many presidents were there in the 20th century? I ask the questions. You don't ask me. <laughs> where, where did this come from, you know? So luckily, I had counted them up before I came here today. There's 18 presidents. And one of the 18 is not George Washington, but I love this joke, so here we go. Young George Washington's probably did not chop down his father's cherry tree. 
And he probably did not admit it by saying, I cannot tell a lie. But many people repeat that story because it shows Washington's honesty. Little Susie once asked her mother, do people who never tell lies go to heaven? Yes, her mother answered. They are the only ones. Gosh, I bet it's lonesome up there with just God and George Washington. <laughs> and then one more, and this guy is also not one of our 20, 18 presidents in the 20th century. But let me share this with you. This is uh, Abraham Lincoln. And I think this is a <coughs> No more jokes. We've got to get serious here. Time is our enemy. This is one from Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln was giving a campaign speech before a very unfriendly crowd. At the end, someone yelled out, I wouldn't vote for you if you were St. Peter himself. My friend replied, Lincoln, if I were St. Peter, you could not possibly vote for me. You would not be in my district. <laughs> so, we're going to take a look here at, uh, like I said, some of these presidents of the 20th century. I want to spend uh, just a little bit of time uh, talking about some aspects of how you rank presidents. Uh, not that it's a, a yardstick that's inflexible. So, uh, let me just share a couple things with you. Again, I teach a course on ranking presidents, and I teach a course on the uh, six most interesting of the 20th century, so I'm combining two courses here. But these are some of the guidelines that I give my adults when we're taking a course on just ranking presidents. And uh, as you can uh, see here, I say remember <coughs> social sciences and so on and so forth are not exact sciences. Remember a president's legacy matters, and get ready to open and stretch your mind. As one person once said, your mind is like a parachute. If it doesn't open, you've got trouble. <laughs> Over the rank of these past 12 presidents will give you some insight as to what to look for and who to vote for in future presidential elections. We're not here just to tell a couple of cute stories about a couple of past presidents, etc. Having some idea of what they went through and so on and so forth and where they stubbed their toe and where they hit success will give you maybe some idea of how to vote for in the future. In evaluating these 12, they're going to be on that report card you can pick up on the way out. Again, it's not enough for everybody, so we're trying to make it one hand out for two people. We expect all participants to be civil to one another. <laughs> and you know, I, I've been teaching now uh, for going on 53 years. Uh, and uh, as John mentioned, I've been doing this little business of mine since 2007. I've taught this in Jersey, Ohio, New York, North Carolina, etc. And I've never had any problems with people being civil towards one another. So, I, 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 there's some people say, oh, you're playing with fire. Uh, no, no, no. Uh, These are some of the evaluators they've used in some of these evaluations in the past. Uh, Grove City going west on uh, IE, etc., etc. Naval War College, Naval Academy. Uh, there's, a, well, I'm not going to mention that by name. Uh, <laughs> State University and so on and so forth. So they really have a real shortage board of people that they choose. And at this point here, I'm going to get back to, well, I better not do that. I better, I better wait. Okay, so uh, we're going to ask you, why should I tell you what five we're going to take a look at? You should tell me. So that's what we're going to do here. Uh, I'm going to turn these over, okay? And without looking, okay, I'm going to ask uh, this person here, don't look at their faces or anything. Pick one of those cards. Pick any card you want. No, that's the wrong card. <laughs> Especially those. 
those who were the brave people who sat in the first three rows have this handout. If you're from row four or five back, maybe you don't. That's the penalty for coming late, okay? <laughs> but if you have a handout and you see one, you sitting there handing the pass to somebody else. Uh, Harry S. Truman. What you see was what you got with Harry S. Truman. Uh, as he moved up through the ladder, he did not use, stop using profanity. Uh, it got to the point when he came on nationwide radio, etc. Uh, Republicans said that when the President of the United States comes on the radio, Harry S. Truman, you should take little children out of the room because they might learn bad words. Okay? Uh, Harry S. Truman here, uh, not a college grad. Who cares? You're not to be a college grad to be president. You've got to be only two things. You've got to be what age? And you've got to be born where? Yes. And again, remember you said born here. Remember, that didn't apply to the first 13. The first 13 presidents in American history weren't born American citizens. They couldn't be because there was no such place as what? Yes. Thank you so much. Until we kill that last British soldier and drive him out with the Revolutionary War, the 13 presidents, the first 13, are proud to be born British citizens. You can't be born an American citizen to use incorrect English. There ain't no such place. <laughs> So in the case of Harry Truman here, he's not a college grad, he is an American citizen, and uh, he is a planning on being a farmer. And he doesn't have a lot of money, and he comes from a family of farmers, and uh, he had so little money that he would plow his fields uh, with a mule, up and down with his mule. And uh, if he got into politics, a reporter finally said to him at one point, they said, well, you know, we heard you weren't too bad as a farmer, you at least broke even and so on and so forth. Uh, how come he got out of farming? Now remember, he's plowing his fields with a mule, year <coughs> after year. And he said, well, let me just say this. Uh, after 10 years of looking up an ass's, a mule's ass, I was tired of it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he was a terrific, and I mean a terrific, piano player. And again, he's now a senator from Missouri, and a reporter said to him, they said, uh, you know, had you gone into politics, Senator Truman, what do you think you might have done? And remember, he's a terrific piano player. And he said, oh, I said, I think I would have been a piano player at a whorehouse. <laughs> what you see is what you get with Harry Truman. There's no pulling punches. There's no doing little polls to see what clothing you should wear or anything like that. He's a very basic individual here. Okay. He's also a man who's going to deal with more issues in a shorter span of time than any president in American history. And that's maybe why he goes down as one of the best. And please don't do him a disservice and say, oh, yeah, he dropped the bomb. There's a lot more to Harry Truman than dropped the, dropping the bomb. It's like saying, oh, well, Abraham Lincoln was the greatest. He led us through the Civil War. Oh, come on, there's a lot more to Lincoln than just that. I earned my three degrees at Penn State University. All three, Penn State University. It's a land-grant college. Okay. Land-grant colleges were established because of the Land-Grant College Act, passed in 1862 passed by the House and the Senate, and Abe Lincoln signed it into law. If he don't sign that into law, I got no place to go to school. That goes for Ohio University and all the other land-grant colleges. So don't associate just the Civil War with Lincoln. There would be no transcontinental railroad without Abe Lincoln. There's so much to associate with him, and there's so much to associate with this guy here, other than he dropped the two atomic bombs on August 6th and August 9th, 1945, on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. This is a man who is going to decide that I don't need Congress's permission. Even though I was only a captain in World War I, I am the boss of everybody who wears a uniform. I'm going to desegregate the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, Coast Guard tomorrow morning. It's a done deal. Why? Because I said so, and I'm Commander-in-Chief. He's going to desegregate the military. Times are ever changing at this point. He comes into the office in 1945. Two years later, who's playing ball for the Brooklyn Dodgers? You got it. You got that right. As Bob Dylan said in that song, times they are a-changing. So, he's part of those changes, I guess you could say. Harry S. Truman, you know how he used to say to people, he said, I don't give people hell, I just tell them the truth, they think I'm giving them hell. At this point here, like I said, we're going to have to do a, a skinny version of all of these. Let me jump up here to uh, States is now this guy here that was on the screen a minute ago, Harry S. Truman. Uh, 
uh, you don't know anybody else except for FDR as your president. Let me start you at the age of 12. You're 12 years old, now you're 13, 14, 15, you graduate from high school, maybe you go to college, maybe you don't, you get married, you have a couple kids, uh, start a business, you know, whatever. You're now 25. Okay, so I started at 12, and you're now 25. Okay? You've known no other president than FDR. People didn't use his name, they just said the president did this today, the president did that today. President FDR dies with cerebral hemorrhage in mid April 1945. The country figures out the, the press made a mistake. There's no way that guy's dead. If it weren't for that guy, my family would have starved, you know, the depression. And if it weren't for that guy, we would have rolled over to the enemies in World War II after they hit us at Pearl. But he is dead. And now you got a guy who was a captain in World War I, and you have a guy who could not make a men's clothing store make a profit when he ran it. Oh, that gives you a lot of confidence. So Harry Truman here comes into the uh, Oval Office in 1945. He does uh, what he needs to do till 48. In 48, he's going to run for his own term as president, rather than just taking over because the boss died. And in 1948, it's going to be one of the most exciting elections in U.S. history. Uh, there's nothing in the Constitution about political parties. They don't talk about Republicans, Democrats. They don't talk about primaries. They don't talk about conventions. Don't talk about it for you read the Constitution. It is our secular Bible. It is our secular Bible. It's not a right that you have in this room that wasn't given to you by the U.S. Constitution. And if you don't like it, pass an amendment. You have 27 amendments total. And six of those 27 amendments were passed in my lifetime. And no, I am not 150. Okay? <laughs> so you can do it. Okay? In this case here, there's no talk of a limiting numbers of presidential candidates. You can have five, six, seven. How about 20? Or how about the normal three and two? But in 1948, you've got four choices. One of them is Harry Truman. Okay, he's been president since FDR died. Uh, he's a racist. This guy's a Strom Thurmond. He was a, a senator and a governor. And uh, the uh, Democratic Party used to have as one of their wings, this is going to sound strange, I know, but it's true, one of their wings was the Ku Klux Klan. And I'm sure we have a Ku Klux Klan <coughs> today in, in, in Pennsylvania in 2024. It's legal. You're allowed to hate people. You're allowed to dress up in bed sheets because you're a coward and so on and so forth. In the 1920s, which is the best year for the Klan, they had five million dues-paying, card-carrying members. Five million! And now this branch of the Democratic Party says, oh, we can't tolerate Truman. He's talking about equality and taking down segregation. We're out of here. So a chunk of the Democratic Party leads, and that's going to be their guy for president. If you want somebody who's real liberal, you've got Henry Wallace. There's your other choice. If you want another choice, well, you have a guy by the name of Tom Dewey, governor of New York. Fine man. Uh, the state police department in New York was corrupt. He busted it up. Uh, did a nice job as governor of New York. Handsome man, more handsome than Harry Truman. Uh, some people said he reminded you of the, the, the best, the, the, the man on the birthday cake, not the, the wedding cake. Around the wedding cake, they used to put a, yeah. That's, so this is Tom Dewey. So your choice is Republican Dewey, racist Tom Thurman, uh, Mr. Liberal here on the screen, uh, Henry Wallace, or a world you vote for, you know, kind of boring Harry S. Truman. Uh, this is the biggest upset of Oregon history until you hit 2016 with uh, Hillary and Donald. Those are probably the two biggest upsets in U.S. history. 2016 with Hillary and Donald, and 1948 with Truman taking on these three. That's the results of this 1948 election. I'll let you look over the numbers here a little bit. In the case of uh, Harry Truman, he's going to deal with more major events in his presidency, uh, probably maybe more so than any president in American history. And I did not include that in the uh, screen here because I wanted to make sure that I mentioned it to you and maybe didn't spend as much time with what was on the screen. Uh, do we have a United Nations today? That's Harry Truman. Do we have NATO today? Yeah, that's, that's Harry Truman. Do we have a country called Israel today? Yeah, that's Harry Truman. And they'll, they'll also change the Presidential Succession Act. And uh, because of Truman and his Secretary of State, we, are, we have Western Europe not go communist like the other half of Europe did right after World War II. So we're not talking things in the past here, people. The reason there is a UN today, a NATO today, and the country of Israel today, and a new presidential succession law is all due to Harry S. Truman. Right. He 
He's the only president in U.S. history who's going to be there when World War II comes to a close. He has to wrap up World War II. And then he's also going to send boys into harm's way in what war? Thank you so much. No president in American history has had to do that. He has, he's making more decisions in a shorter span of time than possibly any president of the United States in the history of the United States. And notice I haven't mentioned the Tommy Bob once, except for Howard Dean. There's more to him than that. And of course, we forgot to mention, of course I did, he disintegrated the military forces, etc. And when a general mouths off to him a little bit too much, in the Constitution, you will never have the military in charge of itself. The Founding Fathers had a huge suspicion of a large standing army. So the president must be a civilian. You never saw a president, even in Eisenhower or Ulysses S. Grant, wear their uniform while they're president. That's an impeachable offense. You're a civilian now. You have nothing to do with the military. If you want to be buried in your uniform, as Eisenhower was, that's fine. But not while you're president. This is a new part of your life. So in the case of Harry S. Truman, he gets us out of World War II. Well, he's there when World War II ends. Okay. Please keep in mind that when FDR dies in Warm Springs, Adolf Hitler holds a big party in his bunker. He is sure that now with FDR dead, the Nazis are going to pull this baby out. So Hitler's around after FDR dies. Hitler's going to be around for a good three more weeks. And Japan hasn't surrendered yet. So Truman has to deal with wrapping up World War II. And then five short years later, you're just back into Milton, Pennsylvania, State College, Pennsylvania, wherever you came from, and you get your notice again, Uncle Sam needs you, you've got to take your uniform out of the closet, we need you to fight the Korean War. And in both wars, it's Truman wrapping up World War II, it's Truman being there for most of the Korea. Plus the UN, plus Israel, all those other things that call off. For those reasons, in the case of uh, Harry Truman here, let's make it clear that maybe that's why a lot of those people who spend their time studying something like this uh, believe he deserves to be out there. So he ranks six out of 43 presidents. Okay. But please remember, this is not math class. Things don't always add up nice and neat. History can be messy. If you like something nice and neat, you don't want to spend too much time on history or political science or something like that. And that's why those handouts will be on those tables when you leave. And you don't have to agree with the experts. Okay. But I think you would agree that some of these presidents may be ranked as high as they do because we've had some presidents in there who left a lot to be desired. Jimmy Carter, Ronald Reagan, Donald Trump, all these other presidents who have come recently are glad that these people were president because it'll keep them out of the basement. <laughs> so let me call off the presidents who will keep these people out of the basement. They're so glad they were president. Okay? And if you say, I never even heard of half of these people, that's exactly correct. Okay? So below, at the bottom of the, the ranking scale are Benjamin Harrison, Zachary Taylor, Rutherford B. Hayes, Martin Van Buren, Chester A. Arthur, Herbert Hoover, Millard Fillmore, oh, Millard Fillmore, <laughs> William Henry Harrison, why is, doesn't he rank higher? He took his oath uh, one day and he died three months, uh, a month later, 30 days later, okay? John Tyler, Warren Harding, Franklin Pierce, Andrew Johnson, James Buchanan. So if you're wondering how some of these recent presidents rank so high, it's because these people are in the basement and they always will be. Okay? <laughs> so, no matter what you do as president, somebody's going to criticize you. As Harry Truman said, and I think it's a great quote, if you can't stand the heat, stay out of the kitchen. All presidents play tough ball. If you can't play tough ball, you're not going to make it to the presidents. Harry Truman could play tough ball, so could Abraham Lincoln, et cetera, et cetera. So no matter what you do, people are going to criticize you. I can remember uh, President Obama was giving an interview one time, and it was just he and the reporter, and they were talking, and I don't know where they were talking, but this fly ended up being a real pain in the neck. And Obama swishes him away, and the reporter swishes him away, and finally landed on Obama's arm, bang, killed him. Oh my gosh, you know, we have that organization today called PETA. <laughs> treatment of animals, and they define animals as everything, mosquitoes, flies, you name it. They sent telegrams, emails, how could you kill that poor fly? It was probably pregnant and you killed it, you cold-bloodedly killed it. So I don't care who the president is, a Republican, Democrat, young, old, handsome, old, they don't make no difference, you're going to have your critics and you're going to have those people who are going to praise you. So let's take a look at the, the praise and the criticisms. This is praise. There never has been a decision made under this man's administration that has not been made in the best interest of this country. It is not only the courage of these decisions 
that we live, with the integrity of it. And that was the Secretary of State. And what did we name after this guy? Marshall. I think he's one of the greatest Americans who ever lived. Born and raised in Uniontown, Pennsylvania. That, that says it all right there. <laughs> uh, Richard Nixon, a Republican. Remember, Truman's a Democrat. His far-sighted leadership in the post-war era has helped ever since to preserve peace and freedom in the world. These are two nice things about Truman. But remember, I don't care who you are, there's always going to be the critics. I mean, look how they're going to you know, criticize Obama for killing a poor little fly. Okay? Truman criticized. This country today is in the hands of a secret inner courier which is directed by agents of the Soviet Union. We must cut this whole cancerous conspiracy out of our government at once. Our only choice is to impeach President Truman and find out who is the secret, invisible government which has so clearly led our country down the road to destruction. Republican Senator William Jarrett in the My wife and I like to travel. Uh, uh, April of uh, 22, we spent a month in Germany. We've been to about 24 countries. And I'll be honest with you people, and I mean this sincerely, uh, a lot of the world is laughing at us. And they're laughing at us because everything's a conspiracy. Everything's a conspiracy. It's all invisible. <laughs> I'll give you the real lowdown after everybody leaves. <laughs> uh, so, there's a, the praise and the criticisms here of uh, Harry S. Truman. I want to share something with you because it goes back to this conspiracy jazz, which it's a shame, I think, it's, a, it's, a, it's almost a cancer growing in America, sometimes by leaps and bounds. Let me share with you what, what somebody wrote here. I saw this in the paper just a couple days ago, and here it goes. Uh, it is a gloomy moment in the history of our country. Not in the lifetime of most men has there been so much grave and deep apprehension. Never has the future seemed so incalculable as at this time. The domestic economic situation is in chaos. Our dollar is weak throughout the world. Prices are so high as to be utterly impossible. The political cauldron seas and bubbles with uncertainty. Russia hangs as usual like a cloud, dark and silent upon the horizon. Okay. Do you think that, that writer's got it on the, on the nose there to some extent? Inflation, Russia? All right, try this one on for size. Harper's Magazine, October 1857. <laughs> let, let me repeat that again. Harper's Magazine, October 1857. So we came today to be depressed. We're all going to hell in a handbasket. <laughs> One of the things that you get when you know your own nation's history and you're not suffering from amnesia is I think you're more mature. And you're not going to run around and say, oh my gosh, the sky is falling. The sky is falling. Get a grip. We are complaining about inflation in Russia. They were 1857 as well. Get a grip. Okay. So, that's a couple of things here on Eric Sherman. So we need to go to uh, somebody else here. Let us go to this lady here in the green. And again, the same rules apply. Uh, do not look at the pictures or the names. And pick the card. Oh, that's twice in a row they picked the wrong card. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's OK. We'll, we'll, go, we'll go with this guy. This guy, when I've been teaching this course now since 2007. And I've had people who said to me, uh, Dr. Fry, I don't understand. How come you got Nixon in there with all these other great presidents? Well, remember what the title of the course is, the six most interesting presidents of the 20th century. I'm not saying he's great. I'm not saying he'll ever be great. I'm saying he's an interesting person. He certainly is that. But before we talk about Mr. Dixon, uh, let me get to uh, what I want to make as far as uh, slides are concerned. And uh, that I can't do until I find my cheat sheet here. And we are going to... Don't touch this. We are going to slide... 113, so let me jump ahead here to 113. Okay, Mr. Nixon. Oh, uh, uh, see that? I'm not even getting where going. It's always this tricky day. <laughs> let's, let's remember, I'm, I'm up here. You're not. You, you, you follow me, okay? So, uh, yes, and that, that became his moniker because he, he played hardball in politics, no doubt about it. Background Richard Nixon. Richard Nixon's, uh, uh, I, I'm not going to pull any punches with you. Uh, Richard Nixon's father uh, must have been born under the number 13. Richard Nixon's father was a loser. Uh, Richard Nixon's uh, father had a lemon farm in California. He couldn't make a go of it for all the money in China. Uh, 
Uh, he sold a lemon farm, and I think it was four weeks later they found oil on the <laughs> they Need I say more? Need I say more? So that's the old man. You're really never close to his his uh, his dad. Most of your great presidents, or most of your infamous people in history books, are mama's boys. Alexander the Great. When Adolf Hitler's mother dies of cancer, the doctor said, "I never saw anybody grieve as much as Hitler did over his mother's death." When the big shot general Douglas MacArthur is going to West Point, his mother got the closest place she could be and not be on the West Point campus, which would not be allowed. And every day at a certain time or every other day, she would wave a white handkerchief and her son would wave a white handkerchief. <laughs> Five star general Douglas MacArthur waving a mommy? Come on! Come on! So Richard Nixon's a mama's boy too. He, has, he wanted his mother to call him dog. She said, I'm, I'm your dog, etc. He's got, uh, I always look at somebody and the tragedies they come from. We were talking about Truman a minute ago, and Jesus' wife, his wife, Bess, she begged him not to get involved in, in running for, for, for senator. And, and definitely, she really put her foot down and said, please don't run for vice president. And Truman really wanted to, and he did. But she was concerned if he ran for vice president with FDR, it would bring out the fact that uh, Truman's wife's mother, Truman's wife's father, uh, had uh, committed suicide. Harry Truman say, if you can't stay in the heat, stay out of the kitchen. In the case of uh, Richard Nixon here, uh, just like Truman, he comes up the hard way too. Some of our presidents are born with a silver spoon in their mouth. Donald Trump, John Kennedy, Franklin Roosevelt. Uh, not so with Harry Truman, not so with Richard Nixon, not so with Abraham Lincoln, not so with Gerald Ford, etc., etc. So in the case of Richard Nixon, he comes up the hard way. His, the, the home that he was raised on before he hit the age of 10 didn't even have indoor plumbing. Okay? So this guy's coming up to Harvard. He has four brothers, and two of them he sees die of tuberculosis. Okay? So, Richard Nixon uh, is a uh, man who has seen tragedy within his own family. He uh, goes off to World War II. He does not see combat. Everybody who puts a uniform on does not see combat. Uh, I told the guy who was a Vietnam veteran, and I always picked the brains of Vietnam vets and so on, and I said, you know, can you tell me, you know, what action you were involved in, what battles, you know, were you wounded, etc. He said, no. So I spent my whole time over there in an air-conditioned office, and the worst I got was a paper cut. Okay. Richard Nixon never saw combat. Ronald Reagan was in uniform. He never left Hollywood. So get a grip. Just because you're in uniform doesn't mean you're going to see combat. Richard Nixon is in uniform, does not see combat. Comes back, he runs, he's in the House of Representatives, and he is sworn in on the same day that John Kennedy is sworn into the House of Representatives as well. He then runs for Senator of California, becomes a U.S. Senator, and as you may have already been aware, for the last, uh, I don't know, 100 years, most of our presidents come from either two breeding grounds. They're either ex-governors, Governor Ronald Reagan, Governor Jimmy Carter, Governor Franklin Roosevelt, or their U.S. Senators, Senator John Kennedy, Senator Obama, Senator Harry Truman. Those are the two places we get our presidents usually, either governor's chair or senator's chair. In the case of this guy here, he's a senator that Eisenhower dubs to be his vice president. Uh, Eisenhower, a fine person, but he knows nothing about politics. And that's why they match him up with this uh, young, upcoming guy by the name of uh, Richard Nixon. Uh, I want to share some other things about uh, Richard Nixon as well, which I think you'll find uh, interesting. Richard Nixon here. Uh, he's going to pick somebody to be his vice president, as they all do. And uh, the person who chooses to be his vice president is this guy here, Spiro Agnew. And uh, as we all know, Spiro Agnew got caught cheating on his income taxes, accepting bribes, etc. He resigned in disgrace in October of 1973 and vanished from the face of the earth. In 1968, uh, Nixon is going to run for a second time for the presidency. He had failed the first time. So let's dial this back. I'm, I'm, I'm rushing myself and I'm rushing you too as well. And I apologize for that. So he's a senator. He shows by Eisenhower to run in 52. Eisenhower and Nixon win in 52. But before they win, there's questions raised about is Nixon accepting money and then using that money to buy his wife a nice fur coat, maybe a new car, things like that, jewelry. And uh, Nixon says, uh, you know, this is this is not this is not correct. Uh, this is wrong. It, 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 it's a lie. Uh, Richard Nixon uh, then calls up Eisenhower to back him up. 
Well, Eisenhower's been a military man his whole life, but he's learning, too, how tough politics can be. And Nixon wants Eisenhower to endorse him, despite the fact that we have this scandal going on involving not Eisenhower, it's involving Nixon only. And, uh, and Eisenhower said, uh, yeah, good luck with that. <laughs> You're on your own, Richard Nixon. And he is so ambitious, just like Abraham Lincoln was, he takes it. So Richard Nixon does something that no politician had done before that. Most Americans don't even have TV sets in 1952, and they're all black and white. And that is he asks the big networks to give him some free airtime. He can't afford that. And they agree. This is, this is good story. This will, this will get a large viewing audience. And he comes on uh, television. He's got 30 minutes. And it's kind of a perfect in the library because behind him was wood, just wood, but it was painted as if there were books on shelves. It looked like a library, just like they're in here. And uh, he said, I just want to set the, the, the record straight. And up until recently, uh, he told you all things about his finances you wouldn't believe. Uh, how many dollars he spends each month on a car payment, uh, on his mortgage. I mean, no, no politician had ever told you that much about their own family finances. He said, my wife, Pat, has never owned a fur coat in her life. She has a, she has a, a good Republican cloth coat. And the camera went over to Pat, who's sitting over here. And Pat goes, and then the camera came back to Richard. <laughs> that's, that's all she did the whole night. But she did small life. She was good. <laughs> and then he goes back to Richard Nixon, and he says, and people send me here. I'm the vice president, they send me stuff. He said, but I always return it. I don't keep that stuff. It would be inappropriate, conflict of interest, etc. He said, but I will tell you this. And this is the truth, he says. And if you watch this, you, you can get this on YouTube. If you don't know how to use YouTube, find, find some 10-year-old. They'll tell you how to do it. <laughs> so you, you go on YouTube, and if you watch this on YouTube, you'll see Richard Nixon in this speech. And he says, yeah, I send that stuff back. He said, but I'm going to tell you something. He said, we got a telegram that there was something for us down at the railroad station in Washington, D.C. And we went down to that railroad station, and we got that. And you know what it was? It was a, thank you so much. It was a little puppy dog. And he said to, he had uh, uh, Julie and Tricia were his two daughters. And he said, what do you think we ought to name it? And it was colored black and white. And the one girl said, let's call it Checkers. And he said, all right. So that became the name of the dog. And he looks into the camera and he says, he said, we return that stuff. But let me tell you something. We are never, ever going to give back that little puppy dog. <laughs> well, you know, uh, back in those days, you've got to be past 73 like I am to appreciate this. But back in the day, you know, ABC, NBC, CBS, they used to have the, the ladies, most of them were ladies, not gender, the bias here. And they would punch in when your phone call came in. You know what I'm talking about, those big words? Okay. And, 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 they lit up, like, they said, like a Christmas tree after Nixon signed off, okay? And you had people call up and say, well, you know, I don't, I don't know if I still trust this guy, but I think I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt. And by the way, while I got you on the phone, if you ever, ever take that dog away from those girls, I'll come through this phone and I'll break both your arms. Don't touch the dog. Don't touch the dog. Uh, and it became known as the chicken speech. Uh, a couple days later, we have a picture of Eisenhower putting his hand around Richard Nixon. Remember, before he wouldn't return the call. And he says to the whole world, he's my boy. <laughs> he, he's my boy now, it looks like he's going to survive. Okay. Uh, in Eisenhower's first term, he has a heart attack. Eisenhower's second term, he has a stroke. Uh, uh, he's the first president to be limited by the 22nd Amendment that limits presidents to two terms. The last president who could have served 500 terms was Harry Truman. Eisenhower won, you know, two and done. Okay? So, uh, who's going to run in 1960? Well, who's, who have you seen in the newspapers every day for the last eight years? Richard Milhouse Nixon. You know him. In the case of John Kennedy, I dare you to name me the two senators from Massachusetts right now this moment. You probably can. Oh, you've heard something about him. I think he's about a war hero or something. I, I, heard, I think I heard that. But that's going to be your choice in 1960, not that the Constitution says anything about being limited to two choices. So your choice is John F. Kennedy, Senator uh, in Massachusetts, or the current Vice President, who took over the presidency twice, once in Eisenhower's first <coughs> term when he had the heart attack, once in the second <coughs> term when he had the stroke. That's your other choice. Uh, it is the separation between John Kennedy and Richard Nixon is going to be about this much. And you say, well, Dr. Furrow, I don't see any separation in your fingers. You're not supposed to. It's that close. Over 70 million people vote in 1960, 
and the difference between the winner and the loser, John Kennedy and Richard Nixon, is 118,000 votes. 118,000 votes. I spent the last 50 years of my life at State College, Pennsylvania. Beaver Stadium holds 106,000. So the difference between the winner and the loser in 1960 is this much. That much. Over 70 million people voting, and the difference is about 118,000 votes. Richard Nixon runs a very hard campaign. So does John Kennedy. You can't stand the heat stay out of the kitchen. And uh, Richard Nixon uh, will uh, send a, a note out to his staff, anybody who collects a paycheck for the Nixon campaign. You mentioned John Kennedy's religion. How far are you so fast your head spin? I can't say that in 1928 when the first Catholic ran for the job. No, 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 that was nasty. But in 1960, Nixon was clean. No mention of the religion stuff. Because if you read our Bible, the U.S. Constitution, it says in there clearly, Article 6, I believe, no religious test for any office, no matter what. For Mayor of Milton or Governor of Idaho, no religious test. There's a lot of things that could have changed that campaign. One of them is, uh, for the first time in U.S. history, we're going to have what? Debates. Presidential TV debates. Don't talk to me about Lincoln and Douglas. They weren't running for president when they had those debates. That was 1858. They were running for the U.S. Senate from Illinois. This is presidential debates. Uh, it's going to be Nixon versus Kennedy. I'm not going to make excuses for uh, Richard Nixon, but he was involved in a car accident before that first debate. There's going to be three debates, by the way. And uh, he is hospitalized, and he gets a little infected. They gave him a couple of antibiotics, and uh, he loses a couple pounds. And uh, Richard Nixon, uh, will appear on television next to John Kennedy. And uh, the background is as gray as this floor. He's got a gray suit on and blends in with the background. John Kennedy comes in with a pitch black suit, black tie, the whole, he's gonna stand out. Please don't say that doesn't matter. <laughs> Go through your house and find all the stuff that they do commercials for every night. You can eat off those cars they sell on television and you probably bought one. We live in the age where image has become reality. Where images become reality. If you look like a winner, you must be. If you look like a leader, you must be. So there's your choice. Richard Wallace, Nixon, John Fitzgerald Kennedy. Uh, John Fitzgerald Kennedy took a couple days off before the debates. Uh, he uh, soaked up a beautiful tan. And again, this is not a gender bias thing. This is not a gender bias thing. But one woman reporter sitting there saw John Kennedy stroll onto the stage. He had soaked up this gorgeous tan. And this female reporter said he looked like a bronze god. <laughs> so they have this debate, and uh, they say to the American people, they say uh, uh, to those people who watched it on TV, who, who do you think won the debate? Oh, man, that Kennedy, man, he really, he really gave it to that Nixon. I'm telling you, I was really impressed by that John Kennedy. And I know this is going to, it's going to sound unbelievable to you, but there were not cell phones in 1960. I know that sounds unbelievable, <laughs> but there's no cell phones. So if I'm a doctor at an emergency room or a nurse, or a janitor at this school, or anybody else. I can't be watching TV, I'm gonna lose my job. But who doesn't want to hear a presidential debate? So you got this thing called a transistor radio. And a lot of people were listening to it that way, on their car radios, wherever they could listen to a little bit here or there. And they said to the people who heard it, not to the people who saw it, who do you think won? And overwhelmingly they said, oh man, that, that Nixon wiped that candy on all over the floor. Notice they were judging it by what they heard, not what they saw. There were three debates between those two. The viewing audience is always biggest for the first debate, and it drops off precipitously for the second and the third, so the damage was already done with the first one. Uh, John Kennedy uh, wins. Uh, some uh, people came to uh, Richard Nixon and said, we can prove that you carry Chicago, you carry Illinois, you should be the president, etc. Richard Nixon uh, thanked him for their efforts. The president was about to be sworn in a couple of days. We're not going to pursue that. It'll divide the country. He's out of a job. He's no longer vice president. The new team comes in. Eight years later, eight years later, Nixon's going to try again. He's going to run for president in 68. He's been out in the wilderness for eight years. He has probably the biggest comeback story in U.S. history and the biggest fall. The run in 1968 against the current vice president from Lyndon Johnson, which was a man from Minnesota by the name of Humphrey. Hubert Humphrey. Thank you so much. 
and also run against the racist governor from Alabama by the name of George Wallace. And I don't throw that word around racist loosely. I'll tell you what George Wallace said when he won his first time as governor of Alabama. Segregation today, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever. That's a quote. You can find it on your YouTube stuff. So you got three choices in 68. And Nixon wins by about 530,000 votes. It's close. The close doesn't count. A winner is a winner. Winners, and, and Nixon comes in in 68. Uh, in the case of uh, Richard Nixon, we should point out some of the things that we still have today. Thanks to Richard Nixon. Excuse me for just a moment. Let me flip the page here. This is a very valuable handout. I think people take a look at it. Okay, so we got Richard Nixon. Okay. Richard Nixon can op open up a whole new relationship with what country? China. Uh, it's under Richard Nixon. There's less chance of you and I dying in a nuclear holocaust. He will sign treaties to reduce the chance of a World War III with, uh, with the leaders of Russia, Brezhnev. It is under Richard Nixon that we do something that Kennedy said we were going to do before the decade ran out, which was to do what? Put a man on the moon. So under Richard Nixon, we deal with China for the first time since they went communist in 1949. Under Richard Nixon, he lessens the chance of you and I dying in a nuclear holocaust. Under Richard Nixon, he keeps the money going into NASA. We land on the moon. And under Richard Nixon, we, he creates something which is, it doesn't fit the Nixon image, and that is it exists today, it has since Richard Nixon, the Environmental Protection Agency. There is no EPA today and ever since Nixon, if it were for Nixon in Congress at that time. So again, I want to get rid of this fluff stuff. Let's talk about the stuff that's still around today that these presidents did. In the case of Richard Nixon, he's going to inherit one war. He's going to inherit Vietnam. Please keep in mind, these wars, you know, they lap over to the next president's term. Now, when FDR dies in his cerebral hemorrhage, the Nazis and Japanese don't say, okay, I quit. You know, your leader's dead. Let's, no, 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 no. Right after 3,000 of us were killed on 9-11, Bush Jr. sent about 200,000 troops in Afghanistan. They are there all through the eight years of Bush Jr. They were there through the eight years of Obama. They were there through the four years of Trump. And they left even over to Biden. These wars can go on under many presidents of both parties. So Richard Nixon comes into the presidency here. He's promised you he's going to get us out. He starts bringing troops home. He doesn't have any, well, not totally out of Vietnam. We had peaked out at 555,000 American boys in Vietnam. And that led to those 59,000 names on that black man that war in Washington, D.C. So, um, Richard Nixon, the war's not over, but he has scaled it down, scaled it down, scaled it down. He runs for president in 1972. He's running against a man, a senator, a liberal Democrat from South Dakota, who was a bomber in World War II, who dropped bombs on Nazi Germany, George McGovern. Ooh, that may not fit your stereotype either. Um, it's not going to be close. But Richard Nixon, uh, I hate to use psychological words, and I'm not even sure I know what they mean. But it, it maybe he's a, a, a textbook definition of paranoia. You know, he played fair at 60 and he lost. And then two years after he lost to Kennedy, he ran for one job and lost by a landslide. Thank you so much, Governor of California. So when he runs in 68 or wants to get back into politics, people say, the loser, Nixon? <laughs> he didn't get elected governor of his own state. He lost to Kennedy in 60 and he was defeated by his own people in California in 62. But he won in 68 over Humphrey Wallace. It is the greatest political comeback in U.S. history. He runs in 72, can't take a chance on losing. So, in the process of Watergate, they're going to commit every crime except for rape and murder. And one of the things nice about our country is no matter how much money you've got, if you've got the facts, you can nail anybody. Uh, if your name is Al Capone, we're going to get you if we got the facts. Not what your uncle thinks, you're Aunt Mary, but facts, cancel checks documents, emails, etc. We got a we got a lady who uh, engaged in insider trading. Some people call her the queen of domesticity. <laughs> I love that name. Queen of domesticity. Okay? Who am I talking about? She used insider trading to make more bucks than you and I because we didn't have that insider trading. She was found guilty of sin, guilty of sin, sentenced to jail. She's a felon to the day she dies. And in jail, she was there for 12 months. I grant you it was a country club prison, but nonetheless. And I said to the other female prisoners, 
We're going to come around in three weeks and we want you all to decorate your cells that you have to live in at night. <clears throat> now remember, this is a lady who's a billionaire. I see her on TV all the time, the queen of domesticity. And they went around and they looked at the cells and so on and so forth. And believe me, I wish I knew the lady's name, but Martha Stewart finished second. <laughs> oh, baby. Oh, I wish I knew her name. I wish I knew her name. So, we have the, the facts that you now, anyway. Uh, like, let's say, Spear I do. The facts was overwhelming. He said he'd never resign. They come in with a, basically an 18 wheeler with all the facts, and he decides to get out of Dodge while they get it through. Um, this is going to be uh, his replacement. Gerald Ford will be the new vice president for uh, Richard Nixon. Uh, so, Richard Nixon had two uh, vice presidents. Spiro Agnew until he resigned in disgrace, and then Gerald Ford. Gerald Ford is a guy who has uh, come up the hard way here. <coughs> Gerald Ford, uh, Gerald Ford was, uh, he's so far the only adopted person ever to be president. He's so far the only Eagle Scout to be president. He's also so far the only person to be all pro in college football for what university? Okay, you said it, I didn't. Okay. <laughs> and, just, and just so you know, these people, these people don't have ideal lives. I think that's important to know about these presidents. Obama's old man walked out when he was two, when he came back. Gerald Ford's old man walked out as well. He does find out whose old man is biological. I'm not talking about his stepfather, they got along fantastic. But when his biological father dies, Ford does not go to his funeral. And Abraham Lincoln doesn't go to his father's funeral when he dies. Because his father said many times in Springfield, Illinois, put those damn books away. You're a big strapping boy. You're going to make your living by your back, not by your brains. Thank goodness Abraham Lincoln didn't listen to his old man. <laughs> so we have Ford. Let's go to 124. There's this bomber pilot in World War II, George McGovern. And then I'm going to discuss here a little bit about Board 8, which should take about 10 minutes, and then we're going to open up for question and answer. How's that sound? Okay? All right. So, let's take a little bit of 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 uh, the Democrats have an office there. Uh, they're going to break in and they're going to put taps on the phone and they'll be able to know what the Democrats are going to do before the Democrats do it. They'll always be one step ahead. They'll always be one step ahead. Um, they break in. I'm cutting to the chase now. Uh, they're caught. Um, Nixon in the very beginning says, I have nothing to do with it. I didn't know about it, blah, blah, blah. And this is going to go from June 72 when they broke in until August 1974, when Richard Nixon becomes the first president in American history, but maybe not the last, to resign. Okay? And he's wanted to be president probably since the age of 10. That's not true of all of our presidents, but it is true of Richard Nixon. So that's the length of this scandal. Um, Richard Nixon uh, believes that if everybody in his administration keeps their mouths shut and so on and so forth, he can weather this storm. He's been through storms before. I mean, after all, there's a speech about the little dog in checkers and so on. And uh, they hold nationwide hearings live on, on, on nationwide radio. And uh, they go and they bring in this guy by the name of Alexander Butterfield. And, uh, and they said to Alexander Butterfield, well, who was at the meeting? Oh, I don't know. I don't I have a photographic memory. Well, well, who came into the meeting and who left? And, and, and how long did the meeting last? And Alexander Butterfield says, oh, I don't know. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm doing the best I can, but, you know, check the tapes. <laughs> <laughs> check the tapes. Yeah, yeah, there's, you know, there's a taping system in the White House. It's voice activated. As soon as, soon as somebody talks, it turns off. And after so many seconds, it goes off. It, there's taping on the, on the phones, too. Oh, there is. <laughs> <laughs> so we know Nixon's guilty of sin. The tapes prove it. Uh, why did he tape? Why did he tape? He tape for the same reason you're in this room right now. He has a real big interest in history. And when he comes to write his memoirs, as all of our recent presidents do, and they open up their presidential libraries like all our recent presidents do, this would be a treasure trove for your PhD candidates in history. Kennedy taped, Eisenhower taped, FDR taped. The only president didn't tape in, in there somewhere was true. Okay? So Nixon tapes, 
Uh, the tapes have to be turned over. He does hand over the tapes, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Notice uh, by resigning, before he's convicted of anything, he keeps a $63,000 year pension. He said, let us chunk change in 2024. We're not talking now, we're talking back in 74. Um, General Ford is sworn in. And please notice what General Ford says here. A long national nightmare is over, and a constitutional form of government works. It is. It, it, it seems crazy to, to be happy on the day Nixon resigns, and I remember it like it was yesterday, but that is the purpose of our Constitution. James, James Madison said, I think, or one of the founding fathers, if all men were angels, we wouldn't even need a Constitution. <laughs> but they're not. So we need a rule book. We need a Bible. It's called the U.S. Constitution. Gerald Ford comes in. I think he's one of the most underrated presidents in U.S. history. Uh, he comes into the presidency, and uh, for the good of the country, he will sacrifice being a president when he runs against Carter by giving that unconditional pardon. Ford's going to lose for a couple of reasons against Jimmy Carter. But one of the reasons is, when does Vietnam go totally communist? April 30th, 1974. Who's president? Nixon's gone. He's back in California. Vietnam falls to the communists on April 30th under Ford's watch. And lots of Americans, even die-out Republicans and Nixon supporters said, I don't understand. 55 people go to jail? They go to jail to the Watergate? 55 people? And to use this man's phrase over here, Tricky Dick doesn't go to jail at all? No, he doesn't. There's only one power that the president has, and he doesn't have to justify to anybody on the planet. Only one. And that's the power to part. If everybody in America doesn't like it, tough. If everybody likes it, that's okay too. But I don't have to check with anybody. I can pardon anybody I want, anytime I want, if they're accused of a federal offense. You can't pardon people convicted of local or state offenses. Okay. <coughs> so, Gerald Ford uh, decides to pardon Richard Nixon, calls in his press secretary, Gerald Terhorst. And he says, I want you to issue this to the world. It's very short, but I'm pardoning Richard Nixon, effective immediately. Ford's only been president for six weeks. And his press secretary, Gerald DeWorce, they were buddies, by the way. They were friends in college. Gerald DeWorce gently put it down on the Oval Office desk, and he said, uh, I'm sorry, Mr. President, I will, I will not be a, a part of this. I, I resign effective immediately. Ford made a couple phone calls, got a new press secretary, and was announced to the world that Gerald Ford was part of Richard Nixon. You could argue, and maybe it's appropriate we should say this on a Sunday, you could argue that it was the epitome. I'm not saying this is a fact. You decide this on your own. But some people would say it was the epitome of a Christian act. I'm not saying you have to buy that. It was an act of forgiveness. You could say Ford sacrificed his political future by forgiving Richard Milhouse Nixon of his sins and giving him a total blanket pardon. And a pension. And the pension. Richard Nixon, 
Uh, I, I don't expect you to remember the dates they broke in. June 72, he re resigned uh, August 9, 1974. You can forget all that. I think the most important thing to remember from Watergate comes out of Richard Nixon's mouth. It's the only job he ever wanted in his life. He had fought so hard. He had won by one of the biggest landslides ever two short years earlier. And now the Republican Party says, you've got to go. Barry Goldwater, Hugh Scott, our senator from Pennsylvania. Barry Goldwater wrote the, the book, The Conscience of a Conservative. So Barry Goldwater, Mr. Conservative, uh, Hugh Scott from Pennsylvania, and uh, Governor, uh, Congressman Rhodes from Ohio. They're the three big shots of the Republican Party. They ask to see Nixon, they come in, and they say to him, you have got to go. You've got to go. And a couple of days later, Nixon asks for free airtime, announces he's resigning, and, and, and he says, my first of all to the White House staff, these are people who work 12 hours a day to, to, to make a regional success. And I think the most important thing, you forget everything about worry, you just remember what Nixon said, the last thing he says before he gets on Helicopter One, he gets on Air Force One, and as he's flying out to, to, to San Clemente, his home, the resignation kicks in. Uh, and uh, it is so appropriate that this is where we end before we open up for question and answer. And John warned me that you're going to have a million questions, so I'm ready. <laughs> but this, this, is what, uh, this is what Nixon said. This is the, this is the takeaway for the Watergate scandal, more important than anything else. I think most of us learned it before we were seven years old. Always remember, others may hate you, but those who hate you don't win unless you hate them, and then you destroy yourself. That is so good, I'm going to repeat. Always remember, others may hate you, but those who hate you don't win, unless you hate them and then you destroy yourself. Richard Nixon was a hater. You can hear him on the tapes. He hates everybody. He hates the press. He hates this group. He hates that group, etc., etc. And that hatred consumed him. And you lost the only job you ever wanted in your whole life. Don't learn that in our major religions. It's not nice to hate. And this guy had to learn the hard way. Most, most of us have a little compass in our belly button by the time we're 16, 17. You know right from wrong. Uh, sometimes they get a little preachy. Uh, towards the end, I will be passing around a plate. <laughs> <laughs> John, I'm turn it over to you, or how do we do this? Q and A. Somebody tries to say something that you didn't say in private, etc. 
And of course, nobody knew they were being taped. You weren't told when you walked in the Oval Office you were being taped. You were being taped, but you didn't know. Okay? So that's one good point. The other point to me was, was very, very good. So he loses to Kennedy in 60, and against the advice of his, the people who loved him, he runs for governor of California two years later in 62. Everybody told him, don't do it. No, I'm not going to listen to you. Runs for governor. Loses to a guy by the name of Pat Brown. Loses by landslide. And that guy's son then goes on to be governor of California, uh, Jerry Brown, for 500 years or something like that. Okay. <laughs> so he loses to this guy's father in 1962. And he has a news conference at this big hotel. I think it was in Los Angeles. And uh, it is something you've got to see on YouTube. Again, that's the table. And uh, he's, this is going to be his last meeting because he is certainly a loser. He lost to Kennedy two years earlier, and now he can't even become governor of his own state. And he calls on the reporters. And I'm going to exaggerate, maybe a little bit, but not a lot. He calls on a reporter in the back of the room. He says, yeah, yeah, you in the back here. Uh, you know, ugly, ugly. That's the one I'm talking to. Yeah, yeah. And then he calls somebody over here. He goes, yeah, you, you in the hideous dress over here. What, what's your dumb question? And the reporter says, what's this dumb? He's got no future, people. It's all done. And at the very, very end, he's on a little bit of a platform in this ballroom at this hotel. He says, you know, he says, I feel sorry for you. He says, because from now on, you're not going to have Richard Nixon to kick around anymore. Yeah. And he storms off the stage. And ABC, a major network, did a half-hour TV special, and it was entitled, The Obituary of a Politician, Richard Milhouse Nixon. Mm -hmm. He's done. You stick the fork in him like on Thanksgiving. He has no future. You can't be a presidential loser and a gubernatorial loser within the span of less than three years. That's why I say, when in 68 he runs and wins, and then in 72 he wins again, it is the greatest political comeback in U.S. history. And it also is when he resigns in disgrace and gives this thing, which I think most of us know when we're pretty young about not hating other people, it is the biggest fall from grace. And sometimes Americans are more fascinated by the fall of famous people than they are by the rise of famous people. So I'm so glad you mentioned that, that, that news conference. Um, yes, all the way to back. Just your opinion. I'm looking at your sheet here. JFK ranked eighth. A lot of people would push him up that ladder. What is your guess? Well, let's, let's talk about that a little bit. I had a hunch that would come up. Um, so, I can get to the slide here that I can use the Okay. Uh, John F. Kennedy. Of all the presidents that are ranked in the top 20, I'll be honest with you, history is a constant learning thing. I gave you these examples before we got started. You got a new movie on the Holocaust, a new book on the Holocaust, you got a book on the love letters, you got the New York Times today talking about Jimmy Carter. So it's a, it's a subject where you have to stay on it all the time. It sometimes gets frustrating in that sense. Um, in the case of John F. Kennedy, I will never understand why the historians and political scientists rank him so high. Sorry. Uh, I'm not a Kennedy fan. Never have been, never will be. Uh, I don't want to go that far. Uh, <laughs> only he got carried away and wanted to back me up. He was stronger than she should have. Uh, no. John Kennedy tries to promote this image of being virile, the, the guy he read the most was Ian Fleming, who wrote the what? James Bond, James Bond books. You know, James Bond, here I am. You know, I'm a war hero, and so on and so forth. He had Addison's disease, people. He got a shot every week for Addison's disease. It's an adrenaline problem. Talk to your doctor, he can tell you all about it, etc. So the image is one of tough guy, James Bond. He's handsome. The wife, she's beautiful. She had the pillbox hat. Every woman in America went out and bought a pillbox hat. They got the two little kids. They're adorable, etc., etc. Versus old man Nixon, who I think is less than two years older than John Kennedy. We're not talking, you know, 42 and 97 over here, okay? <laughs> so this is John Kennedy. Uh, some people say that he will always rank high because his assassination and death blocked out all his negatives. He does not keep one of the most solemn oaths that any man or woman takes. That's your marriage vows. He's cheating on Jackie. That's a fact. It's not open to debates. But that's blacked out. That's blacked out. It's as if after he's assassinated, you can only talk about the good. And I do fall to stories and political scientists who resist in ranking him lower. You say, well, he would have done this, he would have done this, he would have done this. Let's talk about this. 
The House and the Senate was overwhelmingly Democrat. All your presidents get their big stuff done their first two years. He had two full years. The House and the Senate is voted in his favor. He don't get nothing done. And when he's assassinated in Dallas, Texas, we got about 16, 17,000 U.S. boys in South Vietnam. And please don't say, oh, if he had lived longer, he would have pulled them out. There is no proof for that whatsoever. Remember, John Kennedy is a cold warrior, and he's proud of it. He's a cold warrior and proud of it. His father believed that Hitler was going to take over all of Europe, and we shouldn't give the British any aid whatsoever. When John Kennedy ran for the House of Representatives after World War II, he said, I'm not my father. I'm not my father. I'm a cold warrior. We have to stand up to the Russians, etc. And if that means that everybody in this room dies in that nuclear holocaust called the Cuban Missile Crisis, then so be it, because I'm not backing down. I'm amazed at how many people, young people, you know, who are even around when John Kennedy's around, and even to the senior citizens, and they say, oh man, you know, everybody loved John Kennedy. Every, he was the greatest. 118,000 votes. 118,000 votes between Nixon and John Kennedy. It doesn't get any closer. And did he talk good on civil rights? Oh, boy, he talked good on civil rights. He said, if the Congress doesn't act, and they didn't, I'll, I'll use executive action. He didn't. And some, some black leader said, I guess that, that pen was so heavy, he had trouble getting it up to sign up. <laughs> okay. Okay. So here's, here's John Fitzgerald Kennedy, one of four presidents assassinated. Abe Lincoln, James Garfield, William McKinley, and John Fitzgerald Kennedy. This is going to be the problem he's going to have to deal with, and so is Vietnam will be Kennedy's headache, and Lyndon Johnson's, and Richard Nixon's, and then under Gerald Ford, the country falls and goes communist in April of 1975. Okay? Just like you had us invade Afghanistan after 9-11, and it became the headache for the presidents that followed. Every president would like to start off with a clean slate. That just isn't the way it happens. Okay? So this is Vietnam. Okay? This is his administration. The Bay of Peace, that turned out well or not so well? Remember, that was our attempt to invade Cuba, kill Castro, take it over. It was one of the biggest failures you could ever find. As a matter of fact, some people said, if he had not botched that, if John Kennedy had not botched that, there wouldn't have been what the next year? Thank you so much. If you don't botch that, there's no reason for the Russians to have missiles in there. They wouldn't be there because we would have taken them out in April 1961. This ended up being a flop. This is still around today. That's a fine organization, the Peace Corps. Civil rights, all told, no show. 16,000 troops in Vietnam the day assassinated in Dallas, Texas. Khrushchev has so little respect for him. The Berlin Wall is built on John Kennedy's watch. Khrushchev has a son. He has a son older than the President of the United States of America. There is the Cuban Missile Crisis, as you know, the space program, you know about it, etc. Put two judges on the U.S. Supreme Court, Byron White, Arthur Goldberg. Byron White, Byron White. That name rings a bell. Byron White. Somebody help me out here. Byron White. Uh, yes, sir? Foot? Oh, come on. This guy over here says, What's your name, sir? Bob. Bob. Is it really Bob? <laughs> Nobody dies or retires, you don't put anybody on. 
FDR put on eight. Uh, Ford was there for two years, he puts on one. Uh, William Howard Taft was there for four, he put on six. Jimmy Carter was there for four, he put on zero. Nobody died and nobody retired. Luck of the draw. Some people say, oh, you shouldn't <coughs> times in a row, don't ask what your country can do for you, what you can do for your country. If you say it six times in a row, you can get a cabinet. Okay? <laughs> it's, it, it's really sweet. And the mistake that I made, I'll admit I did, the mistake that I made, and maybe you made, and the historians made, and the political scientists made, was we focused like a laser beam on that quote. Don't ask what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. And in the exact same speech on that cold day, where he has no top coat, no hat, and as he's giving his speech, you can see the, the, the exhaling of uh, the smoke coming out. This is what we should have been paying attention to. Remember, he's got 16,000 American soldiers in Vietnam he's assassinated. Let every nation know, whether it wishes us well or ill, that we shall pay any price, bear any burden, meet any hardship, support any friend, oppose any foe, in order to assure the survival and the success of liberty. Ladies and gentlemen, there's your Vietnam. Ladies and gentlemen, there's your, I don't care if we all die in the Cuban Missile Crisis, but we're not back down. I'm a cold warrior and I'm proud of it. I'm not an appeaser like my old man. I'm amazed sometimes at how young, middle-aged, and old people say, if John Kennedy had only lived, we would have joined hands and gone under a tree and sang Goombaya. <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think so. There's your presidential election. As you can see, John Kennedy had 34 million votes. Nixon, he had only... No, 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 
Yeah, yeah nobody's taped since Nixon. Nobody ever will take it. Yes, it stops with Nixon. Yes, for somewhat obvious reasons. So FDR taped, Truman did not, Eisenhower taped, Kennedy taped, Johnson taped, Nixon taped, nobody's taped since Nixon. But what they have and what they always have, unless it's like their family or something, they always have somebody in the room taking notes. And the best example I give is when the Nixon administration got a, a note or a letter, their emails didn't exist back in those days, from this famous singer. And he said, I'd like to meet with you, Mr. President, and I'd like to be an honorary FBI agent. Uh, yeah. Elvis Presley! Are you serious? Are you kidding me? Nixon says, give him 10 minutes, bring him in. <laughs> they bring Elvis in. You don't know what Elvis is going to say. You know, Elvis OD, didn't he own drugs and stuff? So whenever a president meets with somebody, since nobody uses tapes anymore, there's always somebody in the room taking voluminous notes. Okay? So, Unless yeah. the president takes the notes away. Uh, okay, then the second question was? <laughs> the second question is, if a person is convicted of a felony, that's a criminal case, and The question was, what would forfeit, what would cause a president to forfeit his pension? And the answer to that question is if he would be impeached and convicted. But not a felony. Whatever he would be impeached on. Impeachment is more of a political process than a criminal process. So if, if a president is impeached and two-thirds of the Senate says he's guilty of sin, he loses everything. He loses his pension, etc., etc. The first president impeached was Andy Johnson, the guy who followed Lincoln. Second president impeached was Bill Clinton. Third president impeached was Donald Trump twice. But that's only, that could kick into effect only if the president was in office at the time. The post office, then there's nothing. That is correct. You get your pension. That is correct. If, you, if you've convicted of a felony after you've left the presidency, and yes, you get all the benefits of the presidency, etc. Yes. yes. There, was a, there was a hand over here. Yes, sir. A few years back, we went to hear David McCullough speak at Bucknell, and during the day, he said he had spent some time in other universities talking about talking to students about you know, history majors. He went to the university, and he had a class with the uh, in meeting with the seniors who were looking for a degree in American history. And he said, "Well, let's talk about the Marshall Plan." None of them knew what it was. Yeah. And this kind of stuff was taught at high school level, huh? which it used to be, because I remember a lot of this. Why isn't it? That's a great question, and I knew where you were going, sir, and I leaned down and I said to this woman here, I said, George C. Marshall. I, I, first of all, if you want to read history, read Doris Kearns Goodwin. Okay, she's one of the greatest historians living yeah. today, Doris Kearns Goodwin. Uh, whenever she's on television, etc., my wife, we've been married for 53 years, she's just been nominated for the uh, Nobel Peace Prize. <laughs> uh, when I started this business back in 07, uh, she said to me, she said, dear, she said, I took you better for worse, but not for lunch. Go find something to do. <laughs> but, 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 but Sue knows that when Doris Kearns Goodwin comes on television, she, she, uh, this is what she says. She'll even tell you this. She says, your girlfriend's on. <laughs>
ministry, or, or is it all dirty? Well, I don't know if I say all dirty, but like, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I would ask you to read, uh, you know, what they were saying at the time. Um, you know, they're saying they said if Thomas Jefferson was elected president, uh, the Federalists were saying that in all the schools they would teach incest. Well, Thomas Jefferson, yes, you heard that right. Yeah. So I mean, it doesn't get any nastier than that, I don't think. So yes, politics has always been a rough sport. You can't stand the heat, stay out of the kitchen. It's just an eloquent phrase from a guy who knew what it was like as well. Um, and I think that's a shame because since you and I have allowed it to get nasty, okay, since you and I have allowed it to get nasty, I think there's a lot of people out there who are good people who would make good governors of this state, good, good senators of Nebraska, who say, hey, brother, I'm not going to put my wife and I through this. So maybe this is a good way to bring it to a close. Abraham Lincoln gives the Gettysburg Address and all that, yeah, that's nice. But to me, this is more important, and it applies to everybody in this room, including myself. This is Abraham Lincoln, quote. I appeal to you again to constantly bear in mind that with you, and not with the politicians, not with the presidents, not with the office seekers, but with you, is the question, shall the union and shall the liberties of this country be preserved? Abraham Lincoln. It's a participatory sport democracy. Yeah. It's up to you and me who says so, Mr. Lincoln. Yeah. Thanks very much for coming. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.